Hi parents, welcome to our presentation tonight, Building Academic Resiliency During COVID-19. We're happy you could join us. If you need Spanish translation, you will select the option interpretation on the bottom of the screen. Buenas noches. Padres, eh, les damos la bienvenida uh, hoy a nuestra presentación de uh, resiliencia académica, uh, cómo, uh, cómo contribuir uh, durante este tiempo de COVID-19. Eh, vamos a ofrecer una opción en español. Si por favor pueden elegir la opción de interpretación al español, eh, podemos uh, hacer ese servicio. En este momento pueden uh, moverse al, al, al cuarto de español. This presentation is available or will be available in PDF form and a link will be posted in the chat section throughout the presentation. A recording of the presentation will be available um, on the district website in a few weeks. This presentation is being brought to you by the Capistrano Unified School Counselors. My name is Christina Nalbach and I work at Vista Del Mar Elementary. Hi, my name is Bobby Jaramillo and I'm the school counselor at Las Palmas Elementary. Hey, my name is Kathy Ketchum and I am the school counselor at Castile and Marblehead Elementary. Hi, my name is Krista Devenbrock and I'm the counselor at Cal Prep Academy, the virtual and homeschool and Truman Benedict. Hi, I'm Eva Avendano. I'm the school counselor at Shore Cliffs Middle School. Good evening. I'm the school counselor at Bernice Ayer Middle School and my name is Joyce Toledo. My name is Lindsay Morris and I am the school counselor at Vista Del Mar Middle School. My name is Shiree Webb and I am the school counselor at San Clemente High School. My name is Erica Fairweather and I am the other counselor at San Clemente High School. Thank you. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A section located inside the chat box. We will answer questions at the end throughout the presentation and also at the end of the presentation. So by the end of the evening, we hope that you will help your child build, build resilience by getting help with study skills, learning motivational skills and developing stress management and coping skills. We value parent and guardian input and used parent input from the parent needs assessment to develop this presentation. And here are some of the responses from the parent needs assessment. Let's take a moment to answer two questions on your Zoom screen. We will take a couple minutes to answer the questions and I will post the results. Okay, so it looks like we have about half our participants are high school parents or guardians, and then 45% are, are elementary parents and guardians, and then followed by middle school. Here's our second question, if you can answer this one. Okay, so it looks like the majority answered, well, I'm sorry, 44% answered that they are 100% online, their students are 100% online. And then 42% um, are in option B, half online and half at school, and then 100% um, option A, which is 100% um, at school, 24% answered that. Okay, thank you for taking that survey. So I'm going to turn over the presentation to Lindsay Morris. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So first, we want to discuss developmental capabilities. Um, slide, please. Thank you. Uh, at the elementary level, research shows that having a parent who's actively involved in your education drastically increases your odds of succeeding in school. 
Now, just by being here, you're already there. So pat yourself on the back for being engaged and wanting to learn more and wanting to help your child. Um, at the elementary level, even with the big schedule adjustment this year, elementary students are still building skills for learning. You can help them continue to build these skills at home by setting routines and a daily schedule. Um, and this just helps them so they know what to expect from the day. Um, encourage them to maximize their study time and extended learning so they love less homework when they get home, which means they can do fun stuff and have more playtime. Teaching them to advocate for their needs in a respectful way. So that starts with communicating their needs to you. Um, and then obviously the end goal would be that they can communicate their needs to um, teachers and other adults in their life um, in a respectful way so that they can get the, the help that they need. Um, if you have any concerns or if your child is falling behind, um, you are so welcome to reach out to your child's teacher or school counselor. Um, all of us have email and Canvas and phone um, and everyone checks it. <laughs> At the secondary level, remember older students are still developing executive functioning skills. Um, if you remember back to being in middle and high school, some stuff just didn't make sense when it came to time management that you now just comes naturally. And their success really relies on structures that have been created in the home and in school. So like they wake up at 7 a.m., they take a shower, they have breakfast, they brush their teeth, they get dressed. And then their school is from, we'll say eight to three or eight to two. Um, these things are the same, whether they're on campus or virtual. And having that schedule Again, just like elementary, they know what to expect from the day, but also it allows their circadian rhythm and their hormones to fall into a cycle. And that allows them to fall asleep easier and sleep better and be more alert the next day. Um, and as I'm sure you've noticed, when you get a good night's sleep, you are um, a lot better able to handle stress and things that kind of come your way. Um, with time management, work with them to create a daily schedule to get everything done. Now, this isn't like the elementary one where you're really babysitting every step, but just kind of mapping out like sports and activities and chores and family meals and bedtime. And then they can kind of look at their, their weekly schedule and see where the blank spaces are. And then that's all the space for doing homework or playing video games or playing with their friends. Um, but it allows them to kind of see how much time they really have available in the day. Um, with self-advocacy, encouraging them to use their tutorial period to get extra help. Every middle and high school has it. Um, and the teachers really are there to answer questions and help the students understand new concepts. Um, and then with organization, helping them organize their school materials um, and then checking periodically to just make sure it stays roughly organized. Slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the schedule for virtual days. Um, when we know what to expect, we are able to prepare mentally and emotionally. And that is not just kindergartners, that is grownups as well. Uh, it helps us feel more secure and confident in our ability to handle the things that come up that kind of surprise us or catch us off guard. For younger children, like elementary children, um, you can provide a visual schedule with pictures of the things they have to do. Um, and then for middle and high school students who have multiple classes and teachers and a different schedule every day, um, you can use a paper or a digital planner to kind of map that out with them so they know what time they have class, what time they have break, especially on days that they are virtual. Because um, I know a lot of students when they have virtual classes, they forget to log on at the right time. Um, so they can set a timer on their phone or their computer or their alarm clock, um, just to remind them to log in for classes. Um, 
And then also they're using their planner to put it, obviously, assignments and upcoming tests to study for. And then on the next slide, we have some examples of schedules for, on the left side, um, like younger elementary, and then on the right side, older elementary up to middle school, because the high school schedule samples um, just look like an Excel spreadsheet. So um, here are some visual schedules that, that you could use for, for younger children. With prioritizing assignments, um, younger children are gonna need you to prioritize their work for them. And then as they get older, um, it's teaching them how you prioritized it so that they can do that on their own. So for elementary children, um, packet work, obviously if they're given packets, you just do the packet. Um, the older elementary, like grades three to five, uh, you're checking their planner to see what's due and then helping to make sure that they get it done. And then um, for middle school students, um, you're checking to make sure they're using their school provided planner because they've all been given one um, and then helping them prioritize what is due today versus this week versus this quarter. Um, so kind of looking at a timeline of when things are due and doing the first thing first. Um, and then if they have multiple things due, um, teaching them and reminding them to do the hardest thing first while their brain is fresh. So that later when their brain's a little fatigued, they um, are doing the thing that comes a little bit easier to them anyway. So they're not like exhausted and now trying to do something that's really, really hard. For high school students, um, they don't necessarily need to use a school planner, just any kind of planner, paper or virtual. Um, and then at the high school, you're really helping them um, with conceptualizing, breaking out big projects into smaller sections. So if they have a project due in a month that has 12 different sections, um, then we're doing one section every four to five days to kind of get it done on time. Slide please. Thank you. Uh, avoiding distractions. Uh, there are a few common distractions that we hear about from students from kindergarten to 12th grade. Uh, the phone, obviously, I'm sure it's a distraction even to you. Um, for them, they really need the phone to be in the other room or on airplane mode. Because even if it's on vibrate or on silent, they see the screen light up with a notification or a text and all that focus energy that they had has pivoted straight to their phone. Um, so the phone needs to be dis totally disabled. Um, also having a workspace that works best for them. Everybody works better. Everybody works best in a different environment. So maybe they prefer for it to be quiet and no distractions, or maybe they prefer to be at the kitchen table with like a lot of people moving around them. Um, maybe they need to be watched by you, just making sure they're not playing video games, um, or maybe it just helps them to be in the same room as you so that they know they can't mess around because at that point you would see. Um, and so just kind of knowing what works for them. And then there's some kind of frequently overlooked distractions uh, that we don't normally think of, like having siblings laughing or playing video games in another room that then they're jealous and they want to go do that. Or having cute fluffy animals run into the room that obviously your kid wants to play with and pet, um, but that just immediately like the phone, their attention just pivots straight to that. Um, and sometimes you, I'm so sorry, um, but as parents, it is hard for us to not pop in and check on our kid and make sure they're on task. Um, obviously, I'm not saying leave your kid alone all day long, but um, kind of monitoring how frequently you're doing that um, or doing that when you know your kid needs a break. Um, breaks are so important. <laughs> Technology, especially now, is super stimulating. Um, and we as human beings need to take breaks and get fresh air and maybe take a shower or eat some food or move our body um, just to kind of refocus ourselves out of technology. Um, which leads me to the next slide. 
which is time management. So taking regular breaks allows your child to be more productive than if they just power through the exhaustion. Um, and there's two kinds of breaks. So there's a technology break, uh, which is when you've been on the computer or phone or tablet all day, and you still have mental energy left. You just kind of maybe shouldn't be looking at a screen. So uh, you can read a book or a comic if that's what you prefer. You can do arts and crafts. Um, and then there's the brain break, which is when you are so mentally depleted that you like, the thought of expending any more mental energy is just not going to happen. Um, so at that point, you would do something that doesn't require higher level thinking, uh, which allows you to kind of re-energize yourself. So you're in a daydream, go outside for a walk, take a nap or a shower, um, anything that doesn't even require any level of, of thought. Um, the Pomodoro method is a great strategy for managing your time. And so it's based, it's 30 minute cycles. You work for 25 minutes, you get a five minute break. So uh, you can set an alarm on your phone to work for you know 25 minutes and five minutes, get your blood flowing, drink some water, go to the bathroom, have a snack. And then after five minutes, you come back and work for another 25 minutes. Um, and then after four of those, so after four 30 minute cycles, it's been two hours and then you take a half hour break um, and go do something mentally stimulating but in a different area than what you were just working on. Um, and that method has been shown to be super effective in kind of balancing out work with um, taking a break and like letting your brain relax and letting all that information you just absorbed really sink in before you learn more information. Um, so now I'm going to pass it off to Kathy. Hi, family. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we're going to move on to the motivation slide. We'll spend a few minutes talking about the different ways you can uh, motivate your child. Next slide, please. So some big umbrella items. Um, we want to make sure, as touched upon earlier, that you establish expectations regarding routines and goals in your home. Uh, we know that dinners are a great time to talk about these things. And I'm sure you've heard the studies that talk about how, how important dinners are in, in success for children and how meaningful they are and the impact they have on a child's well-being. Family meetings, it's a great time to talk about things, uh, having something yummy to eat. Um, and ensuring that your family expectations, consequences, rewards, routines are all very, very clear. Um, kind of like in if then, you know, if you meet your goal, then this will happen. Or if you fail to log on for your fifth period Zoom class, this might happen. So set goals together as a family, check in on your goals and model. We'll talk a lot about modeling tonight. Model goal setting for your child and use positive feedback. Remember, we all learn through our mistakes and so do children. So in a few slides, we'll talk about uh, the importance of rewarding and acknowledging effort versus intelligence um, versus grades. Um, and if you're interested to learn more about goal setting, you can look into creating um, a smart goal for your child. Next slide, please. Okay, six ideas to motivate your child. Um, number one, do as I say and not as I do. Wait, that's not right. We, we think that way as adults and we expect kids to do what we tell them, but we forget that they are intently watching our every move. So we want to set a good example with our behavior and our actions, not just our words. Um, number two, we'll spend a bit of time again, talking about the importance of recognizing and rewarding effort and how that plays into motivation. So we want to teach kids the importance of effort. Um, we're so used to rewarding intelligence, good grades, test scores, that we fail to give positive acknowledgement for their effort and their perseverance. Uh, number three, always do your best to be calm, even in trying situations. Uh, I always remind myself that if one of my kids is in trouble or something happened, it shouldn't be me that's upset. Um, if we've already set expectations in our home, rewards and consequences and the routines, and we built that into our lives, if our children fail to do something or they do something you know, other than what we expected, 
the consequence really falls on them. Um, and there's no reason for us to get upset. So yelling, criticizing is, is modeling to them whether we, whether we want it to be or not, whether it's intentional and escalates the situation. And uh, number four, check in regularly with your kid. Even those of you with teenagers, they do want to know you care. Um, we have to push through that wall. And this is where expectations and routines are gold. If we've built that into our home, whether it's family movie night or uh, make sure we have a family dinner once a week, we know the expectation is to talk about our day, to share with each other, and it becomes routine. Uh, number five, as mentioned in the last slide, model and set goals for your with your kids, um, like even creating a SMART goal with them. So for example, if your child is getting a 75% in their class, set a small manageable goal. For example, in two weeks, uh, my grade will go up to maybe 90% and I will achieve this by whatever the action step is and then follow up on the progress. The last one is my favorite. Uh, don't always try to uh, rescue your child. We want them to have some independence. Think about the, the butterfly, the typical stereotype emerging from the chrysalis that growth is found in the struggle and kids need to learn to struggle and persevere and they need independence and room to do so. Next slide, please. So growth mindset by Carol Dweck is a big buzzword right now. Essentially, um, if you believe that intelligence is fixed at birth and you're either smart or you're not, I'm either good at math or I'm not, I'm either a great writer or I'm a bad writer, then you have a fixed mindset. However, if you believe that your intelligence can improve, get better through study, through practice, through trying, through perseverance, and that intelligence is like a muscle that grows stronger, then you have a growth mindset. So we can't spend a lot of time talking about this topic, but it really is a fabulous one. And it's very, very big in schools right now. I guarantee you, your teachers talk to your child about growth mindset. Um, there's a lot of great studies on it as well. So you're probably wondering what the connection is to motivation. And you're probably wondering what the connection is to motivation, but how it works is if we believe that no matter how hard we try, will never get better at something. It's hard to feel motivated to keep trying. I can relate to that with math, how I was raised. And a lot of kids have that thing where why do I need to keep doing this? I'm just not good at it. So why do I keep trying? And that becomes a cycle. So, but in order to know, to help our kids, we have to reflect on ourselves. So there is a QR code on the screen and we as parents have to model having a growth mindset to our children. So I'd like if you could take your phone and I'm um, sure most of you know how to use this, but you put your camera on and a little quick two question survey will come up on your phone from the QR code. And it will ask, it will give you a quick assessment of where your mindset is on a continuum. So go ahead and take a minute and, and do that. Okay, so hopefully you're able to get on and, and take that survey. I wonder where you landed on the continuum. Were you surprised by your results? Were you, um, are you thinking about where your kid may be? So just, it's interesting. You can have your child take this as well. Just to briefly go through the other um, picture that's on the slide. Um, we're gonna take an example of a student. It says the green, it says example of a challenge. So a student receives a poor grade or an assignment on an exam. So on the left is a student who believes that their intelligence is fixed, meaning it's not gonna change. I just was born with what I have. Um, so then they're gonna think, you know what? I, I shouldn't even bother trying, this is too hard. Then what you'll notice is they're not trying as hard. They don't have that motivation. They have that decreased effort. 
you'll notice that their academic engagement might be more diminished. And then you have the negative outcome and it is a cycle that just goes through where they're not wanting to try, where they're not feeling motivated, right? But on the right side, you have somebody with a growth mindset. So if they believe that intelligence can change and it can grow with effort, then they'll think, you know what? I have not mastered this yet. And we talk a lot about yet. So I'll work harder. Then you'll notice they say, oh, I just, I will keep working hard. I'll keep learning new strategies. And you'll notice that their academic engagement and performance will improve. And that is a cycle that they go, wow, the harder I try, the better I do. I'm just going to keep trying. That's a good example. Okay, next slide, please. So just briefly, talking about a, a growth versus a fixed mindset, um, the beliefs that children have about intelligence, effort, and struggle impact the choices they make about learning. So briefly again, children with a growth mindset believe that intelligence can be developed. Challenges mean there are opportunities to grow. Mistakes are a part of learning. Mistakes are a big thing right now. We see a lot of kids afraid to make mistakes, but mistakes mean your brain is growing. However, children with a fixed mindset believe that intelligence is fixed at birth. So it's not gonna matter whether I change it or not. And mistakes mean you aren't smart. And we, as counselors, we work with kids a lot trying to help them realize that that just means you're growing. And what is, what's the positive self-talk you can say to yourself when you are making a mistake, okay? So how can we help our kids grow their mindset? Well, like I mentioned, be aware of your own mindset. We as adults fall into a fixed mindset sometimes, but being aware is the first step. Um, practice making mistakes, use growth mindset language, remind them that their mindset does affect their learning and their motivation. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're not gonna play the video because we know the sound doesn't work, but briefly, I just wanted to introduce the concept of grit. Angela Duckworth, she's the author, and her quote there says, Gritty people have a growth mindset. When bad things happen, they don't give up. And it's been shown that a combination of grit as well as self-control, reliance, and ambition were the most reliable predictors of a positive outcome rather than intelligence. And the big change here is that it's basically adding in your passion. So it's saying, what are you passionate about? Let's get you to work hard at that and have a growth mindset with your, with your passion. And I'm, I'm having a, a note that the video might work. So let's try it. Grit. What we now understand is that although intellect and talent are okay indicators of the level someone will reach, the more accurate standard of measurement to see if someone's gonna make it or not is grit. Grit can be summed up in the following formula. Talent times effort equals skills. Skills times effort equal achievement. When you put in effort towards a certain skill set, you'll get better at it. It's a fact. Your talent can determine how fast your efforts will pay dividends and the level of skill that you'll reach. But it's your talent with the effort you put in that will determine the level of your skill set. Okay, so that was our section on motivation, and I'm going to pass the mic over to Erica to talk about stress Great. management. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Kathy. So now we're going to go over developing stress management and coping skills. Stress is the physical, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral responses to challenging events. It is a normal part of everyone's life and it can be either positive or negative. Positive response to stress would be, you know, planning your child's birthday party. A negative response to stress could be receiving a pop quiz. Stress is an interaction between your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors known as the cognitive triangle. Sometimes our thoughts about something can change how we feel about it and therefore affect our behavior and vice versa. For example, feeling fear or anxiety about standing up in front of your class. That can cause the thought of, I will sound dumb. 
A behavior could be, you know, pretending to feel sick in the morning or talking really, really fast. So that way you can finish your presentation quickly. Next slide, please. Is stress always a bad thing? No, it's not. The increase in cortisol, which is your stress hormone, can put our bodies into the optimum stress level to help us study for a test, meet a deadline, or help us run that half marathon. Although some stress is a good, balance is key. As you can see, having low or high stress can cause you to have low performance. Next slide, please. Stress impacts our physical body, mood, and behaviors. So let's say Charlie may have high, an extra high stress level right now because finals are next week and he has, you know, been procrastinating studying and isn't as prepared as he should be. Charlie's stress may manifest by having a headache, stomach ache, um, not focusing, and overeating all of which are not healthy and will not help Charlie be prepared for his final exams next week. Next slide, please. Healthy coping skills benefit everyone in your family. This isn't just for, for our students, our children, but also for adults, because as I'm going to mention in a few minutes, modeling behavior is, you know, how our children learn. Right, so if you're practicing healthy and coping skills, then that's a good example of modeling the behavior for your children. So some examples of um, healthy coping skills are by practicing mindfulness, whether you're into drawing, journaling, writing down your thoughts, practicing deep breathing, meditating, practicing gratitude partaking in healthy lifestyle choices, you know, getting enough sleep and food, but healthy food and exercising. It doesn't have to be extreme, like running a half marathon, but you know, just even walking around your block, walking your dog, jump roping for a minute, um, all can help, you know, practicing your healthy lifestyle choices. Practicing positive self-talk, teaching children how to name, understand, and express their feelings, and modeling. Modeling mistakes for your child and showing your children how to cope with a mistake that you make. And having open communication with a trusted adult. These are all um, healthy coping skills. So how do we assure our children are building relationships with trusted adults outside of your immediate family? By asking your child what they should look for in a trusted adult. You should compare these qualities to those that they look for in a friend. Like what is a good friend? What is someone that you'll bond with? These are things that you'd wanna have in common with a trusted adult. Asking your child which adults in their life they feel comfortable talking to. You know, these can be, for example, teachers, coaches, uh, religious leaders, your school counselors, uh, neighbors, relatives, you know, Girl Scout leaders, any of any healthy, comfortable adult. Discussing what general topics your child might like to discuss with their trusted adults. And these topics may change depending on which adult they are speaking with. Having an open conversation with your child should not be reserved for specific conversations. It should be fluid. Make a habit of always being available for your child, even if they don't take you up on the offer. So now we're gonna watch a little clip on trusted adults. To 
practice talking to kids about their feelings and be consistent with your conversations. Expressing emotions and talking about how things affect us should not be a one-time conversation. Try to find daily opportunities to ask, what do you think of that? Or how did that make you feel? Talking about your thoughts and feelings shows kids that it's normal to express themselves in that way. It also shows them that it's okay to not always feel happy and positive. When you are upset, take time to explain to your child why you might be feeling that way. You might say, it hurt my feelings when, or I'm feeling frustrated because. Normalize feelings as part of everyday conversations. An important part of being a trusted adult is staying informed. Knowing what your kids are involved in, who their friends are, and what they enjoy makes it easier to have conversations with them. Also get to know the other adults in your child's life so that you're familiar with who they spend time with and might see as a trusted adult. Finally, stay educated. Resources on safesecurekids.org address many different topics to help you connect with your child and keep them safe. So research shows that there is a huge impact of trusted adults checking in on students. So nearly eight out of 10 young adults who have had a trusted adult check in on them report feeling less lonely. Being a trusted adult is an important role to play and should be taken seriously. Now we have my lovely coworker, Sheree Webb with our questions and answers. Thank you, Erica. And thank you attendees for your participation. At this time, we would like to give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have of, of any of the panelists or any of the speakers that have spoken this evening. I do have one question in the Q&A section that has been entered that has not been answered thus far. And I'd like to go ahead and read that. The question is, one of the earlier topics talked about creating a routine. Many of our routines have been completely disrupted at this time. We as parents might have had a uh, change to our work hours, working from home, not working at all, or working much more. Whereas we may have been available after dinner to help with homework, now we are working or available only at different times. And this could change week to week. Do you have any tips on helping kids with motivation and readiness for schoolwork when a consistent routine can't be established. And any uh, panelists can take that question. Sheree, can we ask what grade level are we talking about? So we could be specific on which um, counselor answers it. This could be for any grade level where a student is working from home or on a hybrid basis. So any of the grade levels can answer this based on um, their expertise. Um, I'm at the middle school level and I'll take it if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the schedules are disrupted um, as well as the school schedule has been totally disrupted this year and you know changed a few weeks into the school year um you know all all you can do is your best and um there are certain types of routines like when we wake up in the morning we um you know we eat breakfast and then we brush our teeth and then we put clothes on like a very specific order um as an adult you have an order you just maybe don't realize it um, but it's like, oh yeah, as soon as I get out of the shower, I brush my teeth. Um, and so helping them create those kinds of routines, not necessarily the entire day is planned out because as you said, that does change. And with you, um, having a different work schedule, that's, it's just not going to be the same for them. Um, but having these little things or having them, um, you know, when we go to bed 15 minutes before bedtime, we put on our PJs and we snuggle up under a blankie and we read 
two books if they're younger. Um, I'm not sure your high schooler is going to want to snuggle under a blankie with you, but um, just having them create kind of these little routines that when I do this, then this happens um, is going to help them. That's going to give them at least that little bit of comfort throughout the day, even when the bigger things kind of um, fall through the cracks, if that makes sense. I would also like to add an addition to what Lindsay said um, is something that might also help is trying to pre-plan. So if you know that, um, let's say for instance, one week is gonna look very different from the following week, maybe creating different plans ahead of time or different schedules ahead of time. That way you can say, hey, this week, these are what your expectations are, or let's work together on some of these. And then that way you're keeping the open lines of communication. And then you're kind of pre-planning ahead of time so they know what the expectations expectations are and they can have that structure even as your plans um, or schedules may continuously change. Maybe having a few different schedules in your back pocket um, ahead of time might help with that as well. Just to add to that, um, also making sure that your child, um, even at, at a very early age, um, you have an agenda, a whiteboard, even having something in the refrigerator if things are going to change with your schedules is how can we incorporate the time so we could sit down um, at one point during the day so we could review your homework. Or how does your day look for today? If they could foresee if they're keeping track in their agenda, what their assignments are, then that way um, you could also review that with them and um, have an idea what their day looks like and with their work and what has been completed. It not only keeps them accountable, but as a parent, I know it keeps ourselves accountable on how to be able to be of support for them if needed. Um, or if you have any guardians or anybody else of support um, system at your home as well. Thank you for that. We have an additional question. And the question is, any advice for 100% virtual families to handle their students because they get stressed or sad because all they see is what is happening in the classroom or the live instruction days when they are learning from home? And this question is posed for any grade level. I could go ahead and take that. Um, in regards to noticing your child feeling stressed or sad because of students in the classroom is connect with your school counselor because at times they could have a lunch bunch, for example. I know there are different school sites provide different things, but there is a virtual um, type of uh, group supports that at your site, you might not be aware that they're providing. It could be maybe group counseling, it could be a lunch bunch, it could be a variety of things. And so um, just be connecting with your school counselor, see what resources are being provided, see if there's any outside resources within the community that maybe um, during this time of online learning, there is some virtual support where they could feel connected and also feel like a sense of belonging and part of their school. The next question for high school. My oldest child has had some of the worst grades of his life this year. He also had a full on panic attack and admitted thoughts of suicide. What advice do you have for us as parents helping our children when grades are unable to come up before the end of the year? And as a high school counselor, I'm happy to address that question. But if a student is having a panic attack and um, having suicidal ideations, it is very important that that student be seen by a mental health professional as soon as possible so that they can assess the threat level of that student and also um, suggest a treatment plan and therapy for that student on an ongoing basis. The first step might be to contact your school counselor for additional support and guidance. But again, because of the fact that a student has admitted to having thoughts of suicide and panic attacks, it is imperative that they be seen as soon as possible just to make sure that they are not an immediate threat to themselves or um, 
and certainly it can spiral into other things as it relates to academics. So you want to make sure that their mental health is first and foremost, and that is taken care of as it can obviously affect their grades and other things in school. So again, please reach out to your um, school counselor and just make sure that they're getting support as quickly as possible. And I think too, just to piggyback off of what Shiree said as a high school counselor, and I think this can kind of go for any of the grade levels as well. Um, you know, this is, such an uncertain time right now. COVID-19 has definitely sent us all for a whirlwind and you know your student is not alone even though they may feel alone um, and you know you can kind of see by his or her grades that you know things are changing and it could be just because of the isolation. It could be you know just because of the current situation. However, it could also you know be man manifesting from other um, aspects. So, you know, just checking in with your school counselor, making sure that you guys um, are getting resources and additional supports um, inside and outside of school. There's also a follow up question to that from this attendee. And that is they were seen by a professional and is doing better, but wanted advice for academics. Um, I'm not a high school counselor. I'm actually at the middle school, um, but I know just speaking on behalf of middle school, one of the things that we're seeing is um, a lot of students who had been doing well academically previously um, are maybe we're seeing a shift in their grades this time around, no fault to the child of their own. But I think one of the things that um, we need to understand too with students is that they're still developing their um, executive functioning skills. So things like organization, time management, all of that kind of stuff, those are things that they're still developing over time, whether they're in elementary, middle school, or high school age. And so that's, um, I think sometimes when we see a student who had done well previously or doing well previously, um, you know, we think like, oh, they're gonna be successful, they're gonna be fine, they're gonna be okay because they had straight A's before. And then we look at them now and we're like, oh my gosh, like what's happening with your grades? And so I think the biggest thing that we can do for students is helping give them structure because structure, as Lindsay had spoken earlier, is really going to help them understand what their expectations are. Um, and so when they know that on their independent learning day, for example, if they're secondary, um, that they have to work on science and math, like for instance, like on a Tuesday, then on Thursday, they can work on social studies and then English or something like that. So that it's helping them know what they need to do and what their expectations are so that the academic piece isn't falling behind too much. Because again, they're still um, honing in on those um, executive functioning skills, if that makes any sense. And also to just making sure you're communicating with your teachers. I know there's a big disconnect right now with, you know, students and teachers just because we're not able to be in a normal school setting. So there's that lack of relationship um, in some cases. So just making sure you're communicating with your teachers, having your student advocate for themselves, letting them know, hey, you know, I have really been struggling. I've been having panic attacks, for example. Um, you know, is there any way you can meet with me after class just to go over something I missed or I wasn't, you know, able to fully grasp that concept. So just making sure they communicate and advocate for themselves. In addition to that, I would also add just for the high school level that if a student is assessed by a mental health professional and for example, if they were um, placed on a 5150 hold or they are out of school for a period of time to deal with that immediate crisis. Upon, before returning to school, we would typically schedule an SST meeting, uh, which is what help that student transition back into school. So if, if there are directives from that child's doctor, from the student's doctor, that the school should be aware of, um, in terms of making sure that we are helping that student to be successful when they return to school. So we will, we would typically have a transition meeting to make sure that um, anything that um, 
that the therapist perhaps had recommended or the psychiatrist had recommended that we are working in conjunction with those goals just to make sure that the student is supported uh, as best as possible. And if there are any other additional questions, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A section. Okay, if there are no more questions, that would conclude our Q&A. And thank you all again for your participation in that. Thank you presenters, parents, guardians, we value your feedback. Please take a moment to answer the following questions about the presentation. You can either use your phone to scan the QR code or click on the link in the chat box. Also, a copy of the presentation is linked for you. Thank you for attending the presentation. If you have any further questions as well, please reach out to your child's school counselor.